absolutely no pressure then. Right, good afternoon everyone. I'm Alison Coutinho, uh, and like some of you in here, I wear a lot of hats. I'm a partner at Simon Bowden Architecture, a small new practice formed about a year ago, and we're based at Leicester Square. I also run a think tank called the What Now Collaborative, which runs a number of initiatives exploring the future of architectural education and practice. And through that, I do various things like the RIBA Validation Panel, ACA Council, and mentor with the Construction Youth Trust as well which has helped me inform my thoughts on where education is going. Well, we're on the cusp of enormous change, instigated by students, graduates, academic practitioners for many years now, but which will be crystallized by the changes in Europe to be implemented next year. And with change comes opportunity. And I'd like to throw out there some ideas for how change could affect you. So this is where I think we're going to be seeing things going in the next 10 years. Architects and graduates will no longer be stuck in a linear education system. They'll be joining practice earlier and will be ready for practice earlier. They'll be practicing while studying and studying whilst practicing. More architects will have first degrees in other subjects. There'll be more opportunities for students to specialize or diversify their academic interests whilst at architecture school. And so, architects will have a very different understanding of the role of the architect. With that, we have a new breed of architects who can smell, uh, help small practice widen its professional offer. Small practice, therefore, has to be more versatile with the new breed of architects and let them widen the ser services we offer our clients. There's the opportunity to spot talent. Now this talent won't be wearing badges, but they will stand out. And there's an opportunity also for small practices to teach, to partner, to wear lots of hats. Work with schools of, of architecture and be part of a new education system. Now this breed will have the X factor, I assure you of it. But with that, they can also be snapped up by larger practices practices with systems in place that can easily mould new practices. So we have to ensure we are on the radar so that we can spot the new talent, have them be attracted to us as small, unique practices for the right reasons, not just because they need to find a job and they, they go hunting in the yellow pages. So my final thought is for us all to be ready to capitalise and be part of the change. I know change is going to happen. It might look like that, it might not. I don't have to worry about you guys suing me if in 10 years' time I'm stood here saying the same thing and it actually hasn't happened at all. These are famous for last words and I really hope they won't be. I've also spoken really quickly to get my message across. So there are a few slides that will hopefully make you laugh, but they're all thematic and you might be able to see where you'll fit in this. This covers the spotting of talent. I think there's one final slide which summarises the day. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Vaughan. Uh, this is Holly Doran. Uh, Matt Warren, our partner, unfortunately, uh, isn't with us today. Fortunately, he's out to have an operation. But uh, we're SWAT Studio, and uh, we've been asked to talk about alternative visions for the studio. Uh, so we're going to talk about ours. So first of all, a bit of background of how this started back in those long forgotten days of the economic crisis. We are gradually recovering from the economic crisis, but we need to use our negative experiences to help us prepare for the next recession. With homeostasis at the top of this diagram, we adapt to change by coping with the setbacks and then trying to get back to business as usual. We're encouraging homeoresis where we use what we've learned from these experiences to evolve our business strategies to make us more flexible and capable of thriving when changes occur. Homeoresis is evidence in how architectural education has reacted to the crisis. A lot more live projects and student initiatives have been instigated, such as Birmingham School of Architecture's CoLab, to employ and enhance the skills of students who haven't been able to get a job or the right kind of experience to be able to proceed or succeed with the ROBA education model, which itself is changing and adapting to help these students. 
So usually the best option for graduates is to go and find a job, uh, but work's often necessarily unstimulating compared to the kind of projects um, studied at university, um, and employment can be insecure. Uh, so perhaps another option would be to start their own practice, um, but usually graduates lack the experience to do so, uh, and they're faced with the addition of financial risk. So perhaps option three could be uh, to become an academic, maybe do a PhD, um, easy if you've got the money already or you can get a grant. Um, but we're actually exploring another option. Um, so we work four days a week in well-established practices, uh, Matt Warren and I at Glen Howells Architects, Holly at BPN Architects. Um, but one day a week we're SWAT Studio, which is our own practice, completely separate from our employers uh, in terms of insurance and accounts. Um, and we use this day to apply what we've learned from our employers into a small experimental research practice. So some of you might be wondering who's paying for all of this CPD. Well, it's not us so far. Um, we've not invested any money ourselves as of yet. Um, but then again, neither of our employers. Um, we've all taken a 20% pay cut. Um, and then we filled this gap with funding. Um, so uh, we didn't wait for a competition or patient to appear. Um, what we did was think of an idea that benefited other organisations and then inspire them to invest in it. Our investable idea was squats, an exploration of a hybrid academic practice model that promotes um, collaboration between different disciplines. It's a model that squats within Birmingham City University at the moment and it will highlight alternative routes into profession as well as inspiring typically non-business savvy creative students to become entrepreneurs. As well as university funding, we were awarded 10 grand from Deutsche Bank to gather a team of students from departments all across BCU, <coughs> including departments of architecture, fashion, media, engineering and others. This year, the student team is going to design and build a flexible and mobile studio within the art school's atrium. Next year, SWAT Studio, us, and other student-led enterprises are going to squat in it as part-time practices. The result, resourceful students who are prepared to take risks and succeed in the next recession. We want to give students a realistic idea of life and practice. They need to be able to work with a variety of professionals who think in very different ways. Professionals from the creative industries will take part in workshops and advice forums throughout the next two years, perhaps some of you. The, this alternative model is better suited to the next generation of designers who thrive on live projects and teamwork. So, um, why is our vision uh, beneficial to you? Why would you let your staff disappear for one day a week to form their own micro practices? Uh, well, firstly, as I said, it's great CPD. It's giving your green graduates um, a chance to learn about business strat strategy critically at their own risk. Um, and their success, so your success, is it's, it's great PR. Um, so finally, um, I mean, we hope the spirit of experimentation and research will feed back to your own practices. Um, so this is our vision for an alternative architect studio. Um, it is an experiment, so please keep your fingers crossed for us. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi everybody, I'm Oliver Marlow from Tilt Small Practice based in London and my question is, Collaboration is the answer. So what is the question? What I think we're looking at here, this is work from a hands on Rick Obrist in 2004 from chat rooms, and what I want to do is look at um, an alternative understanding of, of progress and where we are, where we are, and where public engagement needs to go and where collaboration goes from that point. So the idea is, is that we're looking at not just competition, but cooperation. This is 300,000 years ago. This is the beginning. This is Neanderthal man and the beginning of the idea of complex social systems, language, and tool making, but most importantly, building. So this idea that we go from this point to a further point is that it's much more about cooperation rather than competition. It's this idea that if you do come together, you can create something more than the simple sum of its parts. So the question is, how did we get from that to this? This is Shanghai. So what's the difference between these two and what are the similarities? Well, the difference is scale and complexity. The similarities, I would argue, are relatively the same in the sense that we are dealing always with humans. We work on complex briefs with multiple stakeholders and a lot of user engagement. And because we work in complex briefs, we're working always with people. So this idea suggests the spiral view. This is a different way of looking at progress rather than something which is linear you're always gaining in complexity from 300,000 years ago to now, but always the complexity is growing, but the context slightly shifts 
you always have to respond to that context, but the questions remain the same. This is Simon Taylor Coleridge, and he suggested that the way to create narrative, the way to understand how these stories are told and how we make sense to ourselves, is to square this circle, as it were. It's the serpent that eats the tail. It is the spiral view. It's not spiral dynamics, this, this idea of gaining complexity and being able to deal with emergence and proximity as opposed to just linearity. So where does that fit in for work? Well, let's consider architecture not as somewhere, a container in which we put things. Let's consider it as an experience of time or a question that remains on, ongoing and open. This is work from an art collective in Zurich, and this is their opportunity to try and bring conversations about the sex trade to the local government. And the way they did that is create a safe space, that boat that then sat in the lake for a day where they had an open conversation without any pressure. A different way to understand space. And then we look at this idea, this is Alan Caprow, and we look at this idea of what is that context of, of dynamism, this something that happens in space, and we look at his work in the happenings. This idea that if you annihilate the audience, if you, rather than having this architect and these users, you bring all those things together and you say, what is true participation? What is the creation of space in a collective sense? What is the social context? The social context is currently this. The idea for a substitute as opposed to a thing itself. So we as architects and designers, do we accept the responsibility of building things which have no intention? The, the audience has been totally annihilated. It's been eradicated. It's been negated. They're not involved in this conversation in the sense, why would they respond in such a way? So if we turn back to the work of Alan Caprow, we look at fluids, and fluids is building 20 of these ice blocks across a city collectively with a simple framework and then they melt away. A simple metaphor for this idea that architecture is ongoing, a conversation that always evolves and changes and there's no fixed sense. Because what I think we need to do is we need to confound our expectations. I think we need to prepare to be surprised by the way that people respond to what's around them. And I think for us, building is about people and not things. I think what we need to do is develop methods to be able to deal with and synthesize and understand complex briefs. And I think, more importantly, we need to treat everyone the same. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Martin Knight, uh, proving that architects can count up to four so far. We're in the right order. Um, these are all successful design competitions. I believe design competitions are a good thing. Uh, they offer architects an opportunity to win work, to impress clients, peers and employers. They give a platform to young and to small practices, and they inspire innovation, reward creativity and drive up standards. And in a world where the architect's voice is not always the loudest or even heard at all, competitions place design creativity at the top of the agenda. Design teams are formed around architects who become leaders again. But how often is the story a negative one? Uh, headlines in a gleeful press of too many architects wasting too much time, losing money, freely surrendering creative intelligence. Uh, this is an example of a project that, uh, a design that won the competition but was never realised. Yet all of these issues are to a certain extent in the hands of architects to address. There are also problems of process, of juries making questionable decisions, of fantasy schemes for fantasy clients failing to become reality, of inadequate or no reward. Yet these can all be equally readily addressed. In short, we need to create a culture of competitions and I think most importantly, we need to radically increase uh, the quantity and the number of competitions which are held. The UK lags behind European clients, both public and private, who routinely use design competitions to procure the design of small and ordinary buildings and structures and landscapes, as well as for the, the grand projet that take the attention so frequently. Yet there is a well-founded and general belief in the UK amongst the design professions and our more enlightened and progressive clients that design competitions can offer important and valuable benefits to clients. And it's the benefits <coughs> to clients that are key to this because if the clients don't take up design competitions, 
uh, then we remain in the current pattern. Under the past president, Angela Brady, the RIBA has campaigned strongly and successfully for broad procurement reform that promotes design above PQQ box ticking, uh, which raises the, uh, the bar for um, small and medium-sized practices, um, and the increased use of competitions by public authorities is a key strand in the Building Ladders of Opportunity uh, reform document that was the result of the, perform the procurement reform group. All that said, competitions have less appeal to clients who don't yet value good design. However, Stephen Hodder, as part of his RIBA for Clients initiative, has set up a new RIBA task group that is reviewing the use of design competitions in the UK, including to make them more relevant and appealing to a wider client base. This review process is underway, and its goal is both to reform and promote the practice of competitions, so we have many more clients who have much more reason to value design from the outset of a project. Imagine being part of a profession where most public building spending was design competition-led, where clients are delighted, architects are properly rewarded, and the designs they create are celebrated by the public. Is this our profession in 10 years' time? I'll leave you with one final image from uh, a recent competition won in Helsinki. Um, and just to, it's worth, I think, always looking across the water to, to Europe and to Scandinavia to see how, uh, how things are done. Um, often they're better done than here, not always. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sylvain Premont. I'm the founder of iMaker. iMaker is uh, um, the leader of uh, 3D printing in, uh, here in the UK and, uh, and in Europe. I stands for I, me, and myself, um, which is you, indeed. And uh, Maker is for making things. Uh, by the way, 3D printing, the term printing is not very relevant, I think. And it's more about making things. Uh, usually my talks are like two, three hours. Uh, we'll try to do that in four minutes. <laughs> I won't. So these are the different techniques. The one that you are interested in are the one on the left and the one on the right. On the left is inexpensive, deals with plastic, very good for models. The one on the right deals with powders. Uh, it can do any material and it's the one that uh, is widely used for the expensive machines. So basically in architecture. These days, for those who don't know really, uh, 3D printing uh, can do almost anything in plastic, almost any kind of plastic, which one you see here. Uh, upright is a reproduction of hypnos from the British Museum. Down there uh, on the left is a marvelous uh, lampshade that we have in our store in London. Uh, but you can also do 3D printing with metal, any kind of metal, any um, um, material, uh, not yet any size. Uh, sadly, it's still for small and medium-sized things. Um, we'll see what happens in the future. And uh, also you can do any other type of material, including sand, who cares for sand, um, glass, um, concrete, sounds familiar. Mm, ceramics is already a big business in the health. Um, wood, down left many more materials. In terms of what is relevant for architecture, um, I should think in, in the short term is obviously doing models, so mostly uh, either in plastic with the affordable technique or in uh, powder, plaster, plastic, whatever, with the more expensive technique. We are talking about different uh, type of models, which makes a, a lot of sense for architecture, uh, of course, um, both for you to share with your customers, but also for yourself to improve your own ideas and share your ideas uh, amongst uh, uh, yourselves, your teams. But in the future, obviously, we'll see real things uh, done in terms of architecture. Today, we already have these beautiful lampshades interior design things like the ball on the right uh, downstairs, but in the future you will obviously see 
real furniture, real things, real objects, large scale uh, coming. So get prepared for that. Um, and my thought is that the, way, the best way to get prepared for that future is to kind of embrace it right now, uh, starting to play with it and uh, have um, uh, one of these wonderful machines doing wonderful uh, things. Obviously, 3D printing can also be used to fix things. But um, So basically, the two ways you may want to engage with this technology to find out where it's bringing you and your future is either go for an affordable machine that you can have in your desk and, and print for yourself things like part of the models or models themselves, or subcontract <coughs> for people like us and others to do models for you, kind of cheaper, faster, and sometimes even more beautiful than the traditional way to get models done. If you did not get a word of what I said due to my accent, please <laughs> have a look in your bag. You should have that leaflet. On that leaflet, you'll see address, telephone, detail, everything to get in touch with iMaker store, um, conveniently located in Clerkenwell, uh, which is kind of where you all are, pretty much. Um, so we have the largest store in Europe and maybe in the world for 3D printing. And you will be able to come there and see my guys, which are all experts, talented, brilliant. They want to talk to you and see what you want to do and how they can help you. Four minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Royston. I'm the business development manager for Crowdcube. Um, so Crowdcube is an equity crowdfunding platform. Anyone I know this? <laughs> So crowdfunding comes in a few different formats. You have rewards-based crowdfunding, debt-based rewards, um, and equity. So this, the problem that my two colleagues, the founders of Crowdcube, faced was raising money is extremely difficult, especially in the current climate. The banks aren't lending. They're not in the business of risk. And raising money from traditional VCs is, is difficult. It's fraught with difficulty. Um, they often impose stringent terms. Uh, it's difficult to access, especially if you're not in London. Um, so the solution that they came up with um, was one day they were watching Dragon's Den and the business didn't fund, which they thought was a fantastic idea. So very much in terms of if Dragon's Den, we are Dragon's Den online. So instead of pitching your business to Deborah, Theo and Duncan, you pit, post it up online on Crowdcube to our nation of armchair dragons and you ask, the crowd to fund your business, pooling all those smaller investments together in one place to help you reach your target. We're regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and we've had some amazing successes in the short time we've been running, only two years. So what we do is we connect entrepreneurs looking for funding for their business with investors looking for businesses and investment opportunities. We've funded over 80 businesses and we have over 50,000 registered investors on our site and it's growing daily. But our success has really come from all the businesses that we funded. Every one of their success stories reflects well on us and it, it wouldn't work without each other. It's an all or nothing, or nothing funding model, so unless they reach the full amount, no money changes hands. We only get paid, we only get a commission unless if they're fully successful. We've raised over £15.5 million in that short time we've been running. Uh, and we're continuing to grow very, very fast. So this is an example of, of what the page looks like. Um, this is Kevin McLeod's sustainable architecture company called Hab Housing. Uh, so you can see up here the, the target that he was looking to reach was a million pounds. You've got the equity that he was offering and the progress. You can see the progress bar. And then it, what he's done is he's laid out the business. So told the story, the, the video, the descriptions, all the information that an investor would need to make a decision as to whether to fund the business, download the business plan and the financial forecast. Kevin actually did very well. He broke the world record, the equity crowdfunding world record, just a couple of weeks ago, um, raising 1.9 million pounds from over 649 investors, which is pretty amazing. Um, each one of those investors becoming a brand advocate, sharing the story of his success, being very passionate about his business, potential new customers and clients. So for an investor, we make it very, very simple. We make it fun, it's engaging, it's really exciting to see the progress and how the funding coming in. We also make it very, very um, 
very simple. We have a, a simple fee structure and we are revolutionizing the whole space. It's never been done before and it's it actually illegal in, it's not legal in the states at the moment, so we've got a two year head start. It is growing extremely fast, like I mentioned, and we can only <coughs> see that this is going to, to revolutionize the whole sector. We believe this is the future of investment and it is the future of fundraising. Um, and we really hope that we can help to break new ground and to help more businesses to fund. In terms of small businesses and architecture companies, I don't believe that it is for everyone and for everything. But for certain projects, I think it's absolutely fantastic to spread the word, to get the word out there of what you're doing. Thank you very much. Successful co-housing groups are made up of idealists, <clears throat> but not Citizen Smith idealists. They're made up of pragmatic idealists who look forward, engage in collaborative design, and produce better housing, anything from passive house to a Chekhovian lunch table in the orchard uh, have been motivations and groups I've been working with recently. This is the most beautiful picture you will see this afternoon for an architect or a developer. It's a site. It's no longer available, I'm afraid. You guys are the only people, and women, the only people who can uh, probably appreciate this properly, except perhaps with a bit of help, co-housing groups. They're the people who can exploit apparently unpromising sites because they know whether they want to live there or not, what's good about it for them. Primary building material, money. <laughs> Citizen Smith would not be good at this. He'd be the last person to get involved in a co-housing project. He never does anything, and he doesn't understand money. When co-housing works, the group decides how to use its money, what to spend it on. Uh, for example, in a group in Denmark, they have felt roofs, not zinc roofs. You can hardly see them. They can save up and have them later. But it's for them to decide. This is uh, possibly the ideal home that you get for the co-housing group uh, that I'm about to tell you a little about. Maria will tell you more about. Um, women in their 50s and upwards obviously want a cottage in the country with roses around the door, don't they? Take this to a house, house, a house builder and you'll get a value engineered version of this, which I haven't given you a slide of. It would be too ugly. Bring it to me. See the resemblance? <laughs> Isn't it? This is our empathetic, touchy-feely design enabler. You do not need to preach to co-housing groups. They are intelligent, experienced people, know more about anything uh, than I ever will. But on the other hand, you don't need to be intimidated by them. And when all the collaborative work has been done, I'm going to give you a tiny snapshot of that. It's important that the designers hold the pencil. Clients. This is um, a quite scary, absolutely delightful group of women <laughs> over 50 called Ouch! Older Women's Co-Housing. Snappy title. Uh, I think they would absolutely make mincemeat of Howard Rourke from the previous slide. Um, the idea that people from all walks of life with all kinds of experience can't design housing is a myth, uh, and uh, this group has demonstrated it. We start with the actual site. We did a guided site where we take people around, open their eyes to uh, what's good, the possibilities, the constraints, and we try and represent things in three dimensions so that people understand them, have a way into the project. When we've done the work on research, we come back um, into, the, uh, into the office, the studio, as uh, James Sobin saying, it should be called, not an office. Um, and we have collaborative design exercises, break into groups, get people to describe with their hands in models, in moving things around the, uh, the site plan, uh, in abstract, how they want to respond to where the sun is, how you get into your site. Uh, a design charrette, a series of design charrettes over a number of weeks with spaces in between them. And this is what we and Ouch came up with. We got a planning permission for this, the first senior co-housing group planning permission in uh, the UK, as far as we know. Uh, it was very heavily contested with the planners, who I'm obliged to say were eventually very helpful. Um, <laughs> it would have been a rather more radical design if Ouch had got their way, but it's in a conservation area. Uh, and I think it will be beautiful when we've built it. In 10 years' time, this is where we'll all be living, in co-housing groups handy for facilities like national theatres, near transport to the countryside, having a great time. This happens to look like the beautiful one that Ouch has developed with us, 
but uh, the people in this room will be developing lots of different beautiful ones all over the country. I'm sure. Shall I slow down to the end of the thing? <laughs> Hello, I'm Maria Brenton, Senior Co-Housing Lead for the UK Co-Housing Network, but I'm also the older end user and co-producer, working with Patrick. In 10 years' time, I shall be nearly 80, and I hope very much not to be working, but enjoying the fruits of my labours in a senior co-housing community with others over 50. Here, we intend to manage our own homes and shared facilities ourselves as a friendly, sociable group signed up to be neighbourly. If that's what you would like for your own old age, much about the UK housing and planning system needs to change radically. For a start, we need to see old age and older people in a different light. I'm happy with ageing. It is a privilege denied to many. Old age is a time when our needs change and living alone can isolate you. But I don't identify with the stereotyped image of me, bent, bowed, lacking capacity, woman needing man to show the way. <laughs> things are changing. My sister says this looks as if we're demented. Uh, things are changing. 70 is the new 50, 80 the new 60. We need to get used to it. More and more older people want to stay in charge of their lives, uh, shape their own environment, co-produce their most valued asset, their homes. More and more of us are searching for a sense of community that validates us as a lively contributing part of society. So here are some ouch women, older women's co-housing high barnet, who've planned this self-determining and mutually supportive community to be built by Hanover by late 2015. The first UK senior co-housing community, it will show the way for older people to be more active in shaping their own lives. Now, important as physical design is, Ouch is more interested in social architecture, building on shared ideals and values to become a cohesive group supportive of its members. And our wide age range is part of the strength and resilience of this future community. So, are we difficult to work with? No, we've learned a lot. We've learned from Patrick, he's a star, We've learned the jargon of developers and how difficult planners can be. We've learned to set up effective structures and communications in dealing with professionals. Mostly, we've learned how to take ownership of our own project. The essence of co-housing is recruiting and getting to know your neighbours before moving in, agreeing, a way of living together, a balance of privacy and community. This takes a lot of time and effort, but it is an investment. So this social capital that Ouch has developed will underpin our management of the scheme, taking decisions together, working through disputes, sharing the work and looking out for each other. How different from the usual models for older people. Key points you might like to think about. <coughs> older people as valid co-producers rather than passive recipients. Housing professionals need to change how they work and see their end users as commissioners and be accountable to them. Creative architects like you need to facilitate participation in design. Planners need to think outside their box. Local authorities need to get to grips with ageing because co-housing is one way for an ageing society to take a healthy approach to old age. There are 14 starting groups in the country uh, looking for co-housing and hopefully will be established by the end of 10 years. But I have to say <laughs> that the Ouch Group is now in its 15th year and we still have not moved into a co-housing community and we won't until 2015. That shows how difficult it is. But I'm here to testify that we're going to do it. Right, hello, I'm Bill Watts. Um, I do have a slide or two. Oh, there we are. Right, I'm going to read this out. Um, energy future in the UK. This is an area blighted, blighted with a potent mix of good intentions, which I'm sure you all have, and vested interests where scoundrels lurk, I would say. Energy policy will be determined by politicians. 
having to juggle CO2, cost, security issues, and of course, grumpy people who are us, the electorate, the NIMBYs, uh, who will basically say no to any new development. So DEC uh, government officials have been tasked with setting out a roadmap for achieving the CO2 reductions that we've signed up to, but I believe that, there are, that their proposals are subject to reversal if they're not based on solid engineering and politics. Perfection is often the enemy of the good. So UK uses energy as gas, uh, electricity and petrol for transport. The DEC proposal is largely for electric heat pumps to displace gas heating and electric cars to replace petrol ones. Electricity production will be decarbonized by using renewables such as wind, tidal, a lot of nuclear and carry on burning fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. Now, um, heating is a seasonal uh, need. One can certainly reduce the amount of the peak loads of, by insulation and indeed using a heat pump to reduce the amount of electricity that you need to do that. But you still have a big peak, le uh, peak load to meet in the winter. And if you're lucky, you might only have to build another 60 gigawatts of uh, generation capacity. Basically, you, we're talking about decarbonizing not just the grid, but doubling it or trebling it. Gas, however, doesn't have that problem. It can be stored, and as long as you use less of it, um, there's plenty of it to go around, and you can even decarbonize the grid should you want to by using electricity or biomass. Now, one of the places where scoundrels lurk is industry heating. Um, basically, it loses heat into the ground. Ironically, the less heat you use the build in, in a building, the greater the proportion of that heat that's been provided is wasted. Unless the heat is entirely free, it is a bad idea. Biomass and waste is not a free fuel. Besides being a, a pain to manage, it will be needed to displace high-grade fossil fuels for aircraft and industry. CHP is another well-marketed idea that does not make sense on closer inspection. The numbers that are published are often optimistic for the CHP and pessimistic for the conventional methods that they displace. The faults of this and district heating is a pet topic of mine, you might have gathered. Solar on buildings is a good idea, however, I am coming to the con conclusion that um, having been looking at this for some time, that solar hot water is a bit of a hassle and photovoltaics although expensive, are delightfully fit and forget. So I would put, put to you that reducing the load is the safest way of dealing with the future. For a building, basically, and for architects, this means reducing the fabric heat loss. But as a word of warning, that has to be done well, and we must make sure that in these very low heat loss buildings, we're not building up a problem of overheating. So one final thing is to say, apart from saving energy, storing it could be a benefit. This is because the production of electricity will either be flat, uh, due to the fact it's going to be from nuclear, or spiky, coming from uh, renewables such as wind and solar. It's not available all the time. So storing energy when it is in surplus um, and not using it when there is a shortage will be very helpful. But the conclusion is, to use less and avoid gimmicks. Thank you. Hello. My name's Zoe. I don't have any slides. But I do have four materials. So that's one per minute. Fingers crossed. Oh, I'll put it the wrong way around. Okay, this is a good sign. <laughs> um, welcome to the future. It's not quite as you planned. It says next to my name, um, are smart materials the way forward? Now, I would never write that because I don't like the term smart materials. My position is all materials are smart materials. So you just haven't asked the right questions yet if you don't think that something's smart. So maybe I'd say to that, no. But I'm going to show you a few materials that fall into the category of kind of wondrous future stuff that 
isn't so future that I can't hold it up and show it to you. Okay, so we're going to begin with a little bit of biomimicry. This is a famous example being Velcro, a system of nature copied to produce something uh, in our daily lives, taking a structure that is seen in nature and mimicking it ourselves. So the latest version of that is something called gecko tape, which is this. This is a material which isn't sticky, okay? So I can't, it's not sticky like sellotape, but on one side of it is the wrong side. See how sticky it was that it stuck to that wood. So what it has on it is hundreds of microscopic hairs. Now those hairs on the other side is actually a proper glue that's now stuck back to the wood properly. Okay, so, <laughs> oh dear. But now that's properly stuck to the wall with a gluey side, what's exposed is the gecko tape side. So this is not sticky, but it's microscopic hairs, millions of them, that increase the surface tension of that material, meaning that when it comes into contact with something smooth, it does actually <coughs> stick to it. Okay, now last time I tried this, I broke my phone, so I haven't tried it with the, the new... Yeah, okay, that works. <laughs> so any smooth surface this gecko tape will adhere to but it's not sticky in the conventional sense, okay, like a glue. It's to do with just increased surface tension. Number one. Number two, let's see what else I've got in my pocket. Okay, number two, this is a bioactive glass scaffold. So this is biomimicry. This is what I like to call biocooperative materials. This is where a material builds upon a biological system and works in cooperation with it to do something new. So this is designed to be implanted into the human body and in place of bone, so it's a bone substitute, but when it's inside you, your body registers its presence and starts to grow new bone inside, into it. So it becomes a scaffold for the growth of new bone, but not only that, a food for the growth of that new bone. So in a period of time, let's call it two years, depending on how big the bit is that's implanted, you don't have an implant anymore, you just have your own bone. So it's designed to be in that border between animate and inanimate stuff and really be about using biological systems to our advantage, devising materials that sit on this animate, inanimate border and are scaffolds for the growth of new stuff and then become that stuff. What else have I got? Okay, this, in fact, I did want to have a microscope up here so I could show you some close-up pictures but it doesn't work with this system. So I, while I sat down there, I took some photos of them. And if you go to my Twitter page, which is at Zoe Laughlin, you'll see the photos that I just took down there. So if you want a closer look, have a quick look on that. I added Reba with them, so maybe they'll forward them on. Anyway, um, if you want to see closer, this is self-healing concrete. So this is a bio-cooperative material again, where it uses a biological system to do something amazing, which is heal itself. So what we're inside this concrete, there are microscopic bacteria, and let me check the time. They um, essentially excrete a material that seals gaps in the concrete. So if the concrete gets wet, the bacteria wake up, they start to eat, there's a food source in there for them, they start to eat that, they poo out a calcite, which actually heals the cracks in that concrete. I couldn't snap this in half, dip it in water, and seal it back together. It's at the scale of bacteria, right? So it's hairline cracks, but as we know, the minute you see the crack, it's already like seven years old, unless there's been an earthquake or something. You know, cracks grow and emerge over time. I realised that with all that faffing around, I stopped my stopwatch, so I don't know how long I've got left. <laughs> but as I'm last, let's just go with it. <laughs> um, next up, out of the pocket of wonder, we have a piece of the famed um, see-through concrete. Okay, So I'll use my phone just to bring up a torch, just to show you. Okay. So there's a company called Lexatron, I think they're called. I don't know. They marketed this thing called transparent concrete. And oh, it's amazing. And I collect materials and I'd, oh, I'd like a bit. And I'd, oh, we don't give samples. And I said, oh, screw you. I'll make my own and um, <laughs> make it better, right? So theirs is like a decorative architectural panel. This is a functional analog screen. You get resolution here, right? So that is my finger passing through. I've made some that go round corners. My dream is that I'll marry a handsome architect and he and I will build our own home and I'll be able to put a piece of this running through and maybe like in the bathroom or some internal space you can have your grid of optical fibres that then are like a light tunnel out. Anyway, 
If anybody wants a date, you can treat me. Um, I think that might be my four minutes. End on a laugh. I, I, we've got no time for invisible balls. Thank you.